Okay, so finally, we can discuss the properties of molecular compounds. So putting together the last few lessons, we're able to draw a Lewis structure of the molecular compound and then predict the bond polarity and together with the bond symmetry, classify the molecules being polar or nonpolar. At that point, we know the types of intermolecular forces that are present in that substance and that allows us to determine properties. So here's an example of a question. Rank the following substances in order of decreasing boiling point. So first, just to understand the instruction here, we have to understand the property of boiling point. So we think of the, the temperature at which a liquid changes to the gas state. It's the intermolecular forces that are being overcome in order for the particles to move further apart and become in the gas state. If we would need to arrange them in order of decreasing, then we're looking at highest to lowest. So we're looking for first the substance that has the highest boiling point. So you have to decide now on the relationship between the intermolecular forces and that property of boiling point. So are we looking at strong intermolecular forces for a high boiling point or strong intermolecular forces for a weak boiling point? First, we have to be clear on that relationship. And if you think about it as the energy required to overcome those intermolecular forces, um, that being the temperature at which the substance boils, then we can conclude that strong intermolecular forces will lead to a higher boiling point. So if we have to arrange from highest to lowest boiling point, we're looking for the substance with the strongest intermolecular forces. So let's okay. consider the um, substances that have been given in the question and go through our analysis. So. Lewis structure, bond polarity, bond symmetry, molecular polarity, and so on. So we look at F2 and draw a Lewis diagram of F2. We recognize there's only one bond in the molecule. So in that case, the bond, we're not looking for symmetry. Literally, the polarity of that bond will determine the polarity of the molecule. We can see that delta En is going to be zero here. This is a nonpolar bond, and that's, that's all that's present. Therefore, it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. And knowing that that's a nonpolar molecule means that we only have LDF forces present. LDF due to how many electrons? Well, fluorine with atomic number 9 has 9 electrons in total, and there's two fluorine atoms here, 9 times 2, 18 electrons. Okay, so there's our analysis of... F2. Now what about CH3OH? Well, we draw our Lewis structure positioning the atoms like this. If you'd like to pause the video and complete the Lewis structure here and then decide on the molecular polarity and the intermolecular forces, that would be great. If you need some more guidance, then keep playing and, and follow along. Okay, so in terms of number of electrons in total here, I have uh, four for the carbon plus three for those three hydrogens is seven plus six for the oxygen is 13 plus one is 14. So I'm looking at 14 electrons here. For this picture, it was seven times two. It was also 14 electrons. <clears throat> okay, so two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. The hydrogens are all stable. Then I move to the oxygen, 12, 14. There we go. And carbon is stable. I can see the eight electrons around the carbon. And so there's the structure of methanol. Okay. Types of bonds. Well, these delta En for the carbon and the hydrogen are um, 0 0.4 here. So we're coming up with, you know, very weakly polar or nonpolar bonds here. But we have a significantly polar bond here. Uh, with a delta En of 1.2 and on the carbon oxygen side we have 0 0.8 and so we can see that there's definitely some polarity in the molecule around the oxygen so if I were to draw bond dipoles here I'd be looking at the vectors pointing here 
Now, in drawing this Lewis structure, I have not shown the shape. It's true, the, water, the molecule does bend at that oxygen, much like it does in oxygen. And so perhaps it's more correct to draw it like this. So if I were to angle my vectors like this, we see the idea that electron density is pushing up towards that oxygen. When you notice the lone pairs, right, the lone pairs here, or in your, um, showing up here in your Lewis structure, then we get the idea that it's asymmetrical. So we have some polar bonds, and we have asymmetry. So that's leading us to just determine then that this molecule is a polar molecule, which means it's going to experience LDF, and it's also going to experience dipole-dipole forces, unless it also has the ability to hydrogen bond. So is H directly bonded to oxygen? Yes, it is. And so that means that a neighboring molecule, so the a neighboring molecule right here, maybe I'll use black, right? There's a hydrogen bond strength shown by the black there. So instead of a dipole-dipole attraction, it's actually as strong as a hydrogen bond. So methanol has the ability to hydrogen bond. Okay, so moving on now to H2S. Add up our electrons, two for those two hydrogens, plus six, we're looking at eight electrons. Again, work ahead of me here, pause the video and work ahead if you know what you're doing. Then we classify the polarity of the bonds, sulfur's at 2.6 and hydrogen at 2.2. So we're looking at 0 0.4 for each of these, which are essentially nonpolar or very weakly polar bonds. Now, you'll notice the sulfur with its lone pairs here is asymmetrical, just like the water molecule. And so right now we have, you might call them nonpolar bonds using our 0 0.4 as the border, but it's also asymmetrical. So when it's asymmetrical, if this delta En isn't exactly 0, 0.0, so at 0 0.4, you know, very weakly, very weakly polar might be a better classification of that bond. Because of the asymmetry, it's going to suggest a, a very weakly polar molecule. And so we're expecting LDF for sure, right? And, and very weak dipole-dipole. There's not a significant polarity in this molecule. Okay, after that we have H2. And as we draw the H2, we realize that this, like F2, has a nonpolar bond only, and therefore it's a nonpolar molecule. Nonpolar molecules are going to experience LDF only, right? And in this case, due to only two electrons. The last substance in the list here is calcium chloride. Hopefully you are recognizing the metal nonmetal here and realizing that this is an ionic compound. And so we know that there are strong ionic bonds, not intermolecular forces because there are no molecular, no molecules here. So strong, strong ionic bonds between the ions. So really, typically, you know, this solid would melt first um, before it boils. It's going to have incredibly high boiling point because the forces need to be overcome the strong ionic bonds, right, and then further overcome to convert it to a gas. So a little unusual to place a solid in this list, but I wanted you to have an ionic compound in there just so that it would draw your attention to that. Okay, so how can we rank these then, you know, from highest to lowest boiling point? So take a look at the intermolecular forces, and remember we're looking to rank from strongest IMF, which we've already decided is going to be the highest boiling point, and when I say IMF, right, the ionic bonds are not an intermolecular force, but they are an attraction between particles, right? So we're ultimately looking at the strongest attraction between particles down to the weakest IMF, which will then be our lowest boiling point. So review this analysis and rank them, and then check back with the video. 
Okay, so hopefully you put the ionic compound first. It definitely, with its strong ionic bonds, is going to have the greatest temperature required to overcome those attractions. Then we move next to the molecular compound with the ability to hydrogen bond. And then down to our molecule that's very slightly polar with its LDF forces and you know very weak dipole-dipole attractions. Finishing with the two substances that are nonpolar molecules, and we ranked the one that had more electrons, therefore stronger LDF due to those electrons, um, ahead of the hydrogen at H2 with LDF due to only two electrons. And so that's how these properties of molecular compounds work. Quite a bit of analysis to be done, diagrams to be drawn, and you're really synthesizing a number of concepts together in order to answer these types of questions.